Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this panel on AI for mobility, ethics and autonomous vehicles. I'm very glad you're here. So um, just for an introduction, you know that autonomous vehicles, you know, is one of the most important and probably hottest topics, you know, like when it comes to the use or the application of artificial intelligence. And um, of course, like the, the um, elimination of the driver poses many important, um, difficult ethical questions. And uh, the questions that we are going to address in this panel are, um, for instance, you know, like, uh, are we able to integrate ethical reasoning in an autonomous car? So what are the challenges um, that, we, that, we have to, uh, that we have to overcome on the way of implementing this technology? And um, let me just uh, refer to, uh, to the social media um, thing. And I would kindly ask you if you, um, if you post um, help to make this uh, panel as interactive as possible. And um, please use the has hashtag TRAIF2021 uh, or the Twitter handle at TRAIF2021, uh, which will help the team like to repost um, and share your images, share your insights. So before we begin, just a couple of words on myself. So my name is Matthias Uhl. And I'm a research uh, professor on societal implications and ethical aspects of artificial intelligence at the Technische Hochschule in Ingolstadt, where we also have um, the AI mobility cluster. And uh, today I'm very happy that we have a panel of five experts, uh, five distinguished uh, speakers, whom I will uh, now introduce. And then you know, like each speaker gets a couple of minutes to um, give some introductory comments and tell us a little bit how his work um, relates, you know, like to the to the ethics of autonomous vehicles. So first, we have uh, Christoph Lütke, who is a full professor of business ethics at the Technical University Munich. He's also the director of the Institute of Ethics in Artificial Intelligence. And Christoph has a background in philosophy as well as business business administration and computer science, and he's focusing on applied research of AI ethics, especially in the field of autonomous driving. And then we have um, Christoph Bartnek, who is an associate professor and director of postgraduate studies of the HIT Lab, New Zealand, the University of Canterbury. He has a background in industrial design and human computer interaction. And his projects and studies have been published in leading journals, newspapers, and conferences. And his main interests lie in the fields of human computer interaction, science and technology studies, as well as visual design. We also have Leon Kester on the panel, who is a research scientist at TNO Netherlands. Leon has a background in sensor and information processing and fusion, as well as artificial intelligence. And his research focus is now at TNO on distributed sensor systems, in particular, the self-organization and self-optimization of intelligence sensor systems. And we have Jerry John Caponio, Professor Caponio is the head of the Quality Assurance and Planning Unit of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, co-founder of the Responsible AI Network Africa, and is also a member of the Ghana Institution of Engineers. So Professor Caponio is currently the coordinator of the West Africa Sustainable Engineering Network for Development. And last but not least, we have Patrick van der Smark, who is director of the Volkswagen Group Machine Learning Research Lab in Munich. Is focusing on probabilistic deep learning for time series modeling, optimal control, reinforcement learning robotics, and quantum machine learning. And he also founded ITAMI, which is an initiative on ethical and trustworthy artificial and machine intelligence to foster the transdisciplinary discourse. So um, I'm glad to have you all here. And um, it would be great if you could, as I said, just, you know, like give some initial thoughts on the topic, you know, what you are working on, maybe how you relate to. Uh, the ethics um, of autonomous vehicles. And um, I would like to start off with uh, Christoph Lütke. Okay, thank you very much, Matthias, for the introduction. And I have a few slides. Allow me to share these. Um, okay, can you see my slides? Not yet, still white screen. Me too. Okay, um, let's let's do it without the slides. Um, 
So uh, I have been, uh, as you just said, um, I have been working on in this field for quite some years now. And actually it started for me with the ethics of autonomous vehicles. So this topic is very close uh, to my heart and I'm happy to say it's also a chapter in our joint book with Christoph and, and our other two co-authors, um, uh, which I also all can invite you to, to read because it's open access and, and free. Um, and um, but what has changed in the in the last uh, one or two years, I think, is is a focus on more concrete and practical guidelines, uh, toolboxes, and and other instruments uh, for for this field. So uh, as I've already said yesterday in my general introduction, I think we are we are now witnessing a move from very abstract guidelines to more concrete ones. And uh, when it comes to autonomous driving, this means a couple of things. Uh, for example, the questions now, who should be responsible in case if there is a crash or, or any other uh, or, uh, yeah, fatalities or, or whatever. And, and that's, that's a question that many companies, are, or all the companies are interested in to know what are their liability issues and what, they can, what can they do in advance about this? What can, what can they do to address uh, problems of liability um, um, and and uh, responsibility in the first place. Also, um, what uh, what are this, what are safe fallback plans um, for uh, dangerous situations? And uh, when it comes to ethics, what constitutes a fair distribution of risks in road traffic? Uh, we we also we need to just uh, address um, not the only the the very. Um, the very the, the highly um, rare uh, questions of uh, the trolley dilemmas, which there was no there was so much focus on uh, during the last years. But I come to more um, uh, to situations which are more important in the daily uh, operations of of these systems. In this case, autonomous cars, and there the question of of risks come up uh, comes up again. Um, how close should a car get? Uh, to a truck, to uh, a bicycle, and others, and and how should we distribute uh, these risks here in in a in a fair way? Um, and um, for for this, we will need to to find uh, more concrete solutions. As I said, uh, we should work on, and we are already working on guidelines uh, for for companies, for organizations, which make these these high level abstract uh, guidelines more more concrete, more practical. And uh, with the AI for People, um, during the last year, we have been working on developing um, um, guidelines um, and, and published them beginning of this year, which are doing this, which are actually stating what, what does this mean, what do the, the um, key requirements and ethical principles for AI in general uh, mean for this sector and for the players who are working in, in this field. So it's I think it's a question of uh, a combination of, of more concrete guidelines, tools, and ethics by design in practice. Thank you. Thank you. So, Christoph Bartnek. I'm not even going to try to put any slides on, so you just have to bear with me right away. Um, I'm, I come from a background in human-robot interaction, and very often these have been kind of human-like robots that we're dealing with, And uh, but autonomous vehicles are just, you know, computers on wheels, and it's also just a human robot interface really. And um, if these cars would drive perfectly, we wouldn't have any problems. There wouldn't be any ethical considerations. You know, everything would be fine. If they're absolutely horrible, it's also easy because we're just not gonna use them and we're also fine. So the hard part is in the middle when they sort of work and that's what gives us all these headaches. And um, well, it seems like a very big player in the market is of course Tesla. And uh, they have an auto, they call it autopilot, at least outside of Germany. And um, there we see all kind of very interesting and intriguing practical interactions. Um, so you will have seen the videos where people fall asleep behind the wheel in a Tesla running an autopilot. And I got really curious about how on earth do you do that? Because clearly Tesla would not allow you to do that. They, you know, you, you actually have to have your hands on the wheel. That is a requirement from Tesla. And they have a torque sensor in the steering wheel that detects this. And of course, it didn't take long. And on AliExpress, you can buy these little weights that you attach to your steering wheel and even have a mount for your phone. 
um, that puts a little bit of weight on the steering wheel so to trick the sensor to believe that your hands are on the wheel and you can fall asleep. That's how they have done it. And then we've started to play cat and mouse. So Tesla comes forward and say like, all oh, right, you know, this is not working anymore. So now we're gonna actually activate the camera that is facing the people. Uh, it's always been there. It is inactivated because the ethical value of privacy seemed to be higher than that of, you know, detecting whether the person is actually paying attention to the traffic. Now that has changed. And now just, I think two weeks ago, um, Tesla introduced a new requirement. So if you want to use the autopilot now, you have to agree to share the video images of the cameras with Tesla's server. So it does no longer stay in the car, it actually is being transmitted to Tesla in case of a crash. And I think this is really kind of the essence about the whole question about liability because Tesla is essentially starting to, to, to lawyer up to protect themselves for potential cases. And so that's really getting interesting. Um, another problem that I see is, and I'm really happy that we've got somebody from Volkswagen here because I'd really like to know more about this. It seems, it's really, really hard to get any kind of reliable data on how good they are. Like how can any consumer make a good decision about whether I'm gonna step into this car and drive with it, may it be a robot taxi or by, may it be an autopilot or anything like this, if we have absolutely no information on how good it is. And if we look at uh, some companies like Waymo, they produce a security or a safety report and they claim they've done, I don't know how many million miles they've driven but this is all meaningless data unless you know more about the context of this actual data. And the only, right now, California is the only one who's forcing car companies to actually um, post information about their safety. And so everybody's jumping on that data. But why is it just California? Why do we not have that everywhere? I mean, it should really be a requirement that all companies that test autonomous vehicles should be obliged to share their safety record and so forth. And of course, then again, it comes back to this, but again, as soon as Tesla sells the car and they're outside of the testing program, then it's just a matter of consumer versus the company. And that's a whole different ball game again. And then we are just relying on the police essentially to start recording it. And in the US since 2019, they start to at least have a recording mechanism for at least when they believe that they know the car has been autopilot, that this information can be collected. And it's all pretty new. But again, there's so much more to safety than just not, not being in a crash. I mean, there's so many other parameters around it. So in essence, we've got some interesting questions to address. And um, if anybody is particularly, uh, Patrick, if you can say something about uh, how we can get information about how good Volkswagen's autopilot is and how safe it is, I would be extremely grateful. Thank you. Okay, Patrick, you wanna jump in directly here? Well, I can only say I have no idea because I am absolutely not working with cars, nor with autonomous driving, nor with any other type of vehicles. So I'm sorry, but uh, maybe I could find the people who know these these things. Um, but it's it's far from me. Okay, that we much appreciate it. I mean, I know. See, companies don't like to give away this data because if they do, they essentially inform their competitors about how far they are, and they just want to hide this information. And for example, if you want to test the car in Singapore, which you can, but it's all sealed up behind walls, you don't get access to this information. Um, and that's a real pity, I think. Well, at, at, at the moment, there is there is at Volkswagen nothing that is close to uh, being deployed. So um, so maybe that, that information is not so relevant at this moment. But Volkswagen is testing. Is Volkswagen also testing in, in California? Uh, Volkswagen is testing in Munich, I know that. Okay. So, I mean, but see, there's a thing, if they're testing on their, let's say, private company grounds, which is not a public road, it's different from testing it on the public road. Yep. But I think if they, as soon as they hit the public road, the information about how well they're doing and how safe they are should be made available to the public. But that's just yeah, my humble view. Okay, maybe, maybe we go, before we go into a deeper discussion, maybe let's have first have the round from people around. Um, maybe Patrick, you want to tell us uh, something about how you relate to the topic? Um, me well, well, that's that's uh, that's a tough one because uh, I don't really directly relate to the to the topic of autonomous driving um, because I'm absolutely not doing any of that. Um, 
but I would like to share my screen and this thing suddenly doesn't allow me to do that. Uh, can I do this here? Let me see. Yeah, I can do that here. All right. Okay, let me see. So I've got a few slides, but um, most of it is, is only remotely relevant. Does that display? Yeah, it does. So, um, so th that's 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 the the what I want to say, right? I'm I'm not at all working in this direction. Uh, my lab focuses on on uh, deep probabilistic models, for time series modeling, and we do robotics, and we do tracking, and we do music creation, and we do uh, robotics, and so on. Um, but we then also got interested. In, let me quickly skip through these things. Um, into the, the deployment of these models um, and especially the risks that are related to the deployment of these models. So um, uh, we, we thought of joining the partnership on AI back in 2017 or 18 um, and, and decided, well, that's, that's nice, but it's, it's just a, a set of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of well-intended uh, ethical guidelines, right? And, and this is just, just a random table of a set of ethical guidelines that exists, but all of those are not actionable. So we, we decided, well, okay, if you really want to, to do that and you really want to go into the deployment of, of machine learning models, and, and I'm, I would prefer not to talk about AI, but I prefer to talk about machining, machine learning because the risk in, is into the... Um, deployment of methodologies, which are not just focused on, on programming, but a combination of programming and, and data, um, then you, you run into trouble in making your good intentions really tangible. So what I did is I said, I, I, I went and started an organization, ATAMI, uh, and it's currently an organization of, uh, of 17 companies and universities and research institutions in Europe. And what we do is, is look into uh, existing ethical gu guidelines, right? Like the the uh, high level ethical group of the uh, European Commission, the OECD, and UNESCO ethical guidelines, um, and combine these with existing standards into a new set of standards, uh, effort, uh, industry standards, and certification of those standards, in order to make the whole process uh, transparent and, and manageable. So. We've been working on that for, for approximately a year, pre-processing pre, uh, pre that for, for two years, but really in this consortium for a year. And the things uh, we are currently going to output soon is first of all, a guidebook, which discusses lifecycle model uh, documentation, uh, transparency, explainability, and, and auditing. Um, and and uh, indeed, one of the main outputs of the of ETAMI is the lifecycle model that we are developing here, uh, and that we are testing now in three of our partner companies in a in a certification pilot to see how does this lifecycle model um, uh, allow you to create a process that supports uh, um, transparency in AI and and transparency and trust in AI, and that then allows you to do ethical, uh, uh, ethical uh, certification. Um, but also uh, we are uh, going to publish a concerned finder, which allows you to, uh, to assess um, uh, assisting prob existing problems um, and uh, work on a documentation approach for these methodologies. So um, that's my short statement. Uh, the, the idea is to really say, how do we from, uh, from um, uh, industry and, and universities join forces in order to make this, uh, the, the, the end user and, the, and also the other businesses uh, create a trust in, in the use of these methodologies. We try to do hard. Of course, you can't prevent problems in all cases, but you can start detecting uh, uh, and 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 solving the problems as they occur. So no autonomous driving here. I'm sorry. Thank you. So um, we have Jerry Caponio next. Okay. Thank you. I'll try and share my screen. Looks good. Okay. I guess you can you can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. 
So uh, a few thoughts on AI for mobility, ethics, uh, and autonomous uh, vehicles. Okay, so in considering the topic, I want to begin by looking at what the major considerations are in the development of autonomous vehicles. Four main considerations I want to put across for our consideration. The first one has to do with sensing and perception. Uh, basically in autonomous uh, vehicles, we try to uh, replicate how humans drive and try to use machines to do likewise. So uh, the artificial intelligence model uses sensors and cameras, whilst in the case of human driving, we are using the five senses uh, in driving. The second major consideration has to do with predicting a path for the vehicle to drive through the environment. And so having been able to perceive the environment within which the vehicle is to be driven, now we make a determination with reference to what is the best path as far as driving the vehicle is concerned. Then having made a determination with reference to the path, we then move on to look at how the vehicle can be controlled by the use of signals uh, to the steering wheel and other parts of the vehicle for the driving to take place. Let me say that in all this, perception is the most difficult phase for the AI system. And because AI systems can easily be fooled by subtle changes. If indeed you have modeled the system such that it needs to respond in a particular way within a certain environment, whenever there are changes, the system can easily be fooled, which primarily means that the system must be super intelligent to be able to replicate what happens as far as human driving is concerned. What then are the key issues as far as autonomous driving is concerned? Some of the earlier uh, panelists have mentioned the issue of safety, issues of privacy. In the case of autonomous driving, we are looking at intuition and decision making and decision making at a very fast pace. Being fully aware of the happenings of the vehicle's environment, it is a difficult task to deal with. Uh, primarily, what primarily this means is that a lot of things happen within the environment of the vehicle, especially in a high traffic situation, which primarily means that a lot of fast decisions need to be taken to ensure that one is driving safely. What are the safety issues? as far as autonomous driving is concerned. Currently, globally, there is no regulation to enforce safety as far as autonomous driving is concerned. Uh, if there is no regulation, how will local authorities deal with the introduction of autonomous vehicles in a market without regulation? I know that in the United States and other places, there are particular states which allow some measure of this, but globally, we don't really have regulation as far as autonomous driving is concerned, which makes it a little difficult as far as introducing it into the market is concerned. There is this elephant in the room that we need to all address. Are autonomous vehicles safer than those driven by humans? If autonomous vehicles are not safer, if the answer is no, then what is uh, the point? Uh, so basically in trying to deal with the issue of making autonomous vehicles safer and uh, easier for humans to accept or to trust in using, the task has to do with the use of more complex algorithms to enhance the reliability of AI systems in autonomous vehicles. For somebody who is coming from an engineering background, reliability is critical. And even if there is a 1% chance of failure, we definitely cannot okay it for use by humans. And for this reason, a lot of research is currently ongoing as far as using complex algorithms to ensure that the reliability of autonomous vehicles can uh, become better. What are the ethical issues as far as uh, autonomous vehicles are concerned? The first one has to do with, are autonomous vehicles safe enough for humans uh, to, to use, especially in a high traffic situation? The second issue has to do with, can users trust autonomous vehicles? The whole issue about trust needs to be dealt with. The third one has to do with who bears ultimate responsibility for the life of the occupants of the autonomous vehicle. If something happens, who do we hold responsible? 
The fourth uh, issue has to do with what should be key considerations in developing a, regul a regulatory framework for autonomous vehicles. I've already said that without regulation, it is very difficult to provide guidance as far as accepting into the market is concerned. But even as regulation has to be developed, in developing a regulatory framework, what should be the key considerations before it is okay for uh, drivers to, uh, for, 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 for people to use. And so these are my preliminary comments as far as the topic is concerned. I am sure that as the discussion continues to go, it gets more exciting and then we can put in a lot more uh, insight. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry, if, if I may jump in immediately, just a okay. very quick comment. Um, the UNEC is preparing regulatory frameworks for this. Okay. So there are quite a few regulatory frameworks on, uh, on autonomous driving underway. Of course, their, their ratification will take a few years, but, uh, mm -hmm. but that's certainly in the making. So you might want to look up their, um, their um, current status that is going on there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before we jump right in the discussion, can we also have Leon Kester uh, please make the introductory statement? Okay, so my name is Leon Kester. I work at TNO and I've been working for, I think, 20 years already on uh, design of advanced uh, uh, AI systems and uh, also applied to uh, collaborative uh, autonomous vehicles uh, as, as systems and how to deal with that. Uh, since uh, already 10 years, I think I also working on the, particularly on the safety issues of these type of uh, systems. And that quickly already also uh, went into the safety of AI itself. So there's currently a field now coming up very quickly on uh, AI, it's called AI safety. And it's particularly about the safety of artificial intelligence itself. And from that perspective, it became already quickly quite clear that we also had to engage in ethics because the whole discussion about what is safe behavior in, in, in these type of systems has also very much to do with how we understand ethics. Um, but when we got further into this type of uh, research on how to really actually uh, assure safety um, on all different type of uh, conditions in an open world, uh, we came also to the idea and also that quickly accelerated when uh, my wife and Marie Aliman did her PhD on AI safety domain in, in all type of artificial intelligence. We came to the conclusion that we not only have to be experts on artificial intelligence and the most advanced forms of artificial intelligence, uh, experts in ethics, uh, experts in uh, law even and how to regulate that, uh, but also we concluded that we had also had to look into uh, moral psychology and neuroscience, how humans actually view morality and what actually they, how they actually interpret what is actually good or bad behavior. And finally, we end up that we also needed to really deep dive into the philosophy of science itself. So what is true and what is good and what's bad and all these type of discussions, we really needed to engage in that. And we even came to the conclusion that even to answer a very simple question, like for example, a safe distance, what is a safe distance? We immediately, if you dive really deep into that problem, you immediately come to the conclusion that you have to have some kind of an understanding of, <laughs> because people tend to talk about then, okay, well, we more or less ask people around what is more or less safe behavior or what's the safe distance even. But you immediately, if you dive deep into this problem and try to implement actually an algorithm to keep a safe distance to the, you immediately run to the problem that you have to actually have to specify what is safe. And that means, and that is already in line, as already mentioned, that there's now a lot of discussions about the uh, EU and worldwide regulation of artificial intelligence and high-risk AI systems, and particularly autonomous vehicles, is, of course, such a high-risk AI application. 
that somehow, in, and also in order to understand and really have some kind of an idea of what, how AI can be trusted, because this is also a very big discussion now, what is trustworthy AI and how can we actually trust these type of systems, that we need to somehow dive deep into the problem of what actually we see as humans as harm. So what is actually physical, but also psychological harm. And because in the standardization committees around the world, now people talk about risk and risk reduction of these type of systems. But if you see what is happening in the standardization committees, then we specify actually risk as the probability of harm. So if we want to make any progress here, we really have to understand, there are even statements where we work with several uh, groups around the world, in which most people come now to the conclusion that in, it is hard to understand or how to have trust in AI systems if there is not a shared model of morality, which meaning in, in, in first instance, in these type of applications, a shared understanding of harm. Because if there is no, is no shared understanding of harm, then how can we trust these type of systems? So this is a fundamental problem. And what we also found is that actually the technology of artificial intelligence is currently not far enough and will probably not be far enough in, in the coming 10 years that it is really human-like. So there's also a lot of misunderstandings, I think, about the uh, nature of the current AI systems, which cannot really understand ethics. So they cannot really understand what is good or bad. So the only thing what we can do is we as humans try to formulate as best as possible for these type of systems, what actually is uh, uh, good or bad in mathematical terms. So this is what we call now the field of moral programming. And that is a very, very young field. Uh, uh, and, it, and it needs to, what I already said, in this, type, in this field, we try to integrate all these different uh, science domains because what we see now from our research is that we all, all need this to do this, to make a good job. Thank you. An interesting aspect there is that, of course, uh, since machines are not like humans and machines have no moral intuition as humans have, you are forced to make it explicit in mathematical terms. Exactly. 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 And um, the interesting aspect of that is, of course, that from a technical perspective, it's very easy. Like you can actually just, the car can count how many people are in my car, how many people are in your car, so we can kind of negotiate who's going to die. We can do all of that. So actually, I pitched some time ago the idea of, it's called Rent a Saint, a saint. So the idea is like you just take somebody like Barack Obama and you just hire him to sit in your car because, you know, what is the more valuable life than Barack Obama, right? So nobody. So you'll be super safe, you know, and you can just drive anywhere without any crashes. Just get some some monks, you know, some good people in your car. That should do the yeah. Thing. Well, I think an important thing to mention here is that in when ethics is discussed, a lot of people immediately engage in what they think is good or bad, or what they think themselves are and how it should be organized. What we found is that we have to take one step back. We have to first understand how at all we could somehow formulate in mathematical terms what any type of uh, morality framework is. So this goes to actually the epistemic uh, formulation of what we are actually understand as humans as harmful. And, and therefore we looked into moral psychology because from there we see that the current ethical frameworks that of course we can talk about uh, consequentialist ethics and about virtual, virtual ethics, about uh, deontological, deontological ethics and so on. But we, what we found is that all these type of representations, I think, they are simply the two simple representations of human morality. So in the field of moral programming, as we, we, we went further into that, we found uh, more, more sophisticated 
formulations of what actually would be understood as human morality in this sense, and how that could be implemented in, in mathematical terms. And one of these one of these ideas we call augmented utilitarianism, which is not to be confused with utilitarianism because it's quite a different uh, thing. But these are what, these are few ideas we we are generating now to, see, and it's extremely hard because we know all these discussions about ethics and all the history about it. But as we see it from now, there is no alternative because any way you would approach this type of problem, you will always end up in this type of uh, discussions, how actually humans see that because humans finally are the judge about whether we want to accept this type of behavior in society. Maybe Leon directly related to that. I mean, uh, maybe if we, if we start off with a with a question of risk, because Christoph uh, Lutke, you know, like has referred to the um, unavoidable accident case, you know, which is what basically fortunistic ethics is discussing um, all the time. And then, you know, like sometimes, I, I get the impression that when you talk to engineers, you know, like the focus is very much, you know, like on the probability. So it's it's all about avoiding the accident, you know, like yeah. the ethicists, you know, like at least some of yes. them. I yeah. focused, you know, like on the utilitarian idea of, for instance, minimizing the numbers, and yes. there are very different conceptualizations of risk. So one side is thinking about the probability merely, you know, like avoidance. Say, we're, we're not discussing this. These are questions of the ivory tower, uh, um, but they are. But, but you know, they, there is, a, of course, another conceptualization of risk, which basically means it's, it's the product of the probability and the severity um, of, of an accident. So sometimes I wonder, and I would be interested in what, what your take on this is, I um, mean, all of you, whether, you know, like the, the, the trolley that we are discussing, you know, so much, uh, probably far too much, um, and that we should move like to a risk ethics, is, is, you know, like the appropriate way to see it just a stochastic? trolley problem that we are facing instead of a deterministic one? Well, okay, so maybe to, to uh, I think it's the same definition. So risk is the probability of harm or probability of the severity of some kind of injury. So, but harm is also normally seen as physical and psychological harm in general in the, for example, in standardization committees in, Euro in Europe and, uh, and JTC21, for example, but also UN and all, all others. So this is basically, I think, more or less the, the same. Uh, but there, then there's, there, I, from my perspective, there are different types of escapes people use <laughs> to not uh, come into trolley-like uh, problems. So what I see, oh, we want to, re we want to prevent it at all. So we don't want to at, at all have this. Well, we're already seeing that for high-risk AI systems, this is impossible. So there always are risks. There are always the probability that something can go wrong and you cannot really avoid it. So the only thing you finally can do is try to reduce this as much as possible. But if you want to reduce it as much as possible by an AI system or by a system, actually you need some kind of a mathematical expression what you actually try to reduce then. So this is the issue. So what the problem is currently, as we see with the discussions about trolley problems is one, of course, it's, it's kind of fabricated, but it's also meant to be in our face. What we found is that basically this, the way out of this type of trolley problems is that the representation is simply not adequate. So the representation that is being used like consequential ethics or virtue ethics or deontological ethics or rules, it is simply not rich enough to really represent what humans actually think about this. So we, what we have been doing is trying to come up with better representation than these sim very simplistic representations, because there is <laughs> where the trolley problem originates from. Well, the nasty thing about asking humans about what they think is that humans have absolutely no problem at holding two contradictory beliefs in their brain and be okay with it. So yes. if we go for the moral machine uh, experiment, if you look at the results, um, what came out of it is that it means all trolley problems, but as a result, um, male life was preferred over female life. So, yeah. and that's kind of the end of it. So if ethics becomes just a popularity contest, um, yes. then we're not doing very well. So even asking humans about their beliefs is also not necessarily a way out. But this is related to the very same problem. So actually, what is happening, and humans do not even realize that. By asking a question, they already have chosen a representation 
of what they actually are asking. So this is the problem. So we really have to realize as humans that we actually almost immediately start thinking in terms of consequential uh, utility or whatever. While the real thing we have to realize is that we first have to understand a good model of morality before we even a start asking questions. This is maybe. where <laughs> this is about. So yeah, people, maybe when, when one addition knows, if you ask, if you ask a, a person, do you want to be safe in your car? They'll say, yes, 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 I want to be safe. Yes. And if you're yeah. asking, do you want to come to your destination quickly? They'll say, yes, 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 yes. yes. And of course, but this, these but this is this, the, prob the problem is that it is language. And we know already language can, there's a semantic gap there. So we yeah. know already language cannot immediately be translated to an implementation in an AI system. So this is where the, this is why it is important to first understand what you actually want to know before you even start asking uh, uh, questions. Yeah, I think this, this is a very valid a valid point. Uh, um, I think for years we have been uh, too quick to accept certain frameworks that 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 this this entire problem was was framed with. Uh, and uh, I remember when when I was part of this ethics committee for autonomous driving in Germany, uh, which the the report came out four years ago already, um, and actually regulation was passed based on that just th this year. Uh, but but when we did that, one one of the key points we already said then was um, we shouldn't we shouldn't focus too much on the trolley dilemmas. Um, it is important to to avoid getting into these situations in the first place and and see how what what can we do from a from a, a technological point of view, uh, but also from other points of view what, to to avoid these situations at all. And 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 I think um, in in this line it 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 is it makes quite a lot of sense to 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 shift to a to a risk uh, focused approach. Um, something which we are doing here at the Institute, which, which is also at the core of the new uh, European Act, uh, at least at the, the draft of it. Uh, and um, I, I think that that will certainly uh, certainly change uh, a few things. And, and, um, and this entire trolley uh, discussion is, is interesting, of course, but it's, it's in, in many cases, it's, it's very much apart from, from the real world. Uh, if if we, we uh, if we can come back home with reference to linking this discussion to uh, the use of autonomous vehicles, I just want to throw in the whole discussion of risk, harm, and in developing a regulatory framework, how much risk is tolerable, how much risk is okay uh, before the regulatory framework will check the box as far as autonomous vehicles are concerned. The reason I bring this to perspective is that, I mean, whichever form of transportation that you are looking at, whether humans are driving it or whatever it is, there is some level of risk in each one of them. But with reference to the current discussion that we are having, how much risk is sufficient and how does that inform the regulatory framework moving from one country to the other. I think that that is crucial as far as making a determination as to the safety of autonomous vehicles is, is concerned. Uh, that, that, that's my thinking there. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, but uh, again, I think humans, and this is, this is what I see happening all the time. If we humans talk about it, we immediately lured into some kind of a framework in which we then say, okay, well, I find this risky or not. But we really have to focus first again on what do we actually mean in mathematical terms here? Because this is the only language an AI system, me as an AI system developer, I cannot even start to design an autonomous vehicle if I'm not completely clear where the system is optimizing on. And it is not me as a system engineer to specify actually where the system should optimize on. So this is the problem. So we talk as people talk about ethics, but we need to understand how our talk can be translated to mathematical terms and be implemented in this system. And this is, and I think there are a few obstacles in the world why this is so difficult to establish. And there are a few things is that still there are a lot of people who think that this can be done by law, so by rules, and we already have so many papers that that is simply impossible to have 
good behavior simply by applying the traffic rules, for example. So this is the first thing. The second thing is that a lot of people think that if we have a lot, lot of data, this, these systems can automatically learn what is good or bad. This also is a mistake because it's still the human who chooses the representations to learn. So this is, again, very important to realize that it is always humans. It is still, even if you use deep learning or whatever type of technique you use, it is still humans who choose the representations to optimize on. So, and if these representations are not reflecting our morality, then that is useless. So this is a big misunderstanding from the uh, deep learning uh, community. And then there is these people who think that AI can construct it itself. So if they interact with humans or through language, then AI is possible or understands how to construct actually what, what humans mean with good or bad behavior or risk. So, so, so Leon, I, 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 I need to I need to interact here because yeah, <laughs> of course uh, there is. Uh, the, the, you're just talking about cost functions, right? And, and you, you do a Lagrange optimization of your cost functions, and and there you go. This is solved from a technical point of view. Yeah, if you have your cost function, that's what you're saying. Naturally, that's true. Um, um, but but to say that first of all, humans choose their optimization. I find that a very daring uh, daring uh, thing to say because I don't think that humans choose optimization, but it is innate from uh, first of all the physics that we are dealing with, right? If you're talking about 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 transport, for instance, you have a lot of physics involved there, and that really limits your uh, your choices. And secondly, the kind of representation that our brain does, which is somewhat compared to to uh, to state space models, latent variable models. Uh, well, we can discuss there, but not today. Um, but that that really limits your choices. Secondly, now you have to put on top of that uh, within the legal and well within the legal system certainly, or the ethical framework that we work with. Um, a language model, right? This, uh, this hinein interpretieren, as I like the German word to say that. Um, so, so what we actually do as humans is we try to, um, to, to explain the behavior that we have chosen because we are optimizing certain cost functions, which are not so easy to extract. Um, uh, but, we, but we try to do it and we use the language to explain that as a reflection of, of what actually what actually was being done. But of course, there is no direct relation to, to the, the expression of that, the language describing that, and the actual actions that were done, uh, because those are to a large part coded in the spinal cord, right? I mean, it's a lot of stuff that, because of the predictive coding that we do, you do a lot of your reactions, luckily in your spinal cord, because that allows you to be very fast. So, so I think you have to see this slightly different that the, um, the, the, the language models on top of our behavior that is trained to be uh, optimal with respect to la di da la di da, um, uh, you have to see them uh, cut loose from the behavior itself. So in New Zealand, we have got, like many other countries, a database of all car crashes that happen every year. Yeah. And it's only yeah. around 350 people who die. So yeah. more sheep than people die in New Zealand. Yeah. But um, interestingly, the government has one column in this database, which is called social costs. So every crash is associated with a dollar value. So if you want to have an, a value to optimize, you can just take that. Um, but then of course, the, the, again, um, it's very simple when we can say, do you want to be safe? Everybody says yes. Um, and um, uh, we could just reduce the speed to 30 kilometers an hour on the road. We would have far fewer deaths and everything would be fine. But um, the issue is still about what are we willing to accept? What is the price that we're willing to pay for our convenience? Is something there is yeah. no, I think there's no math around it. I mean, it is really right. just, what am I? And, and so the interesting way to ask the question actually is, is to ask people, because if you ask people, how much are you willing to pay for being safe in your car and not get killed? Everybody will say, well, of course, everything. I will give all my money because that's without it, I'm useless, right? So that doesn't yeah. work. So the only way out of it is to ask questions around the way, well, 
um, how much would be, we've got this extra software update and it will increase the safety of your car by 5%. Uh, how much are you willing to pay for that, right? And then you get away from this absolute, I will give everything numbers. And that way you can start digging into this kind of- Maybe to elaborate because, because I think it was to uh, make clear on my statement why AI cannot learn ethics um, is because, um, for example, the approach you could say, okay, we take all the data and then we start learning. Still, I mean, if what we look now, if we do ethics, we immediately jump to very, very simple, uh, basically utility functions. So this is, these are human constructed utility functions. This is not something that is being learned from the data. It, so this is the, this is, and you cannot learn, this is already, already known, you cannot learn from all possible situations what to do in situations that never happened. So this is also an illusion to think that you could learn from all possible solutions that really happened, what, how you could make a causal model basically of what to do in all different types of circumstances. Because in an open world, all the circumstances that are happening there is infinite. So, and it's also not explainable. And it cannot be explainable because it is simply not, it is simply a correlation. So you need somehow a human constructed model which gives you those explanations because also a judge wants to have explanations. So, and also in the questions you ask, you already try to, you already <laughs> formulating this in some kind of a representation. What you're actually asking for is already something in a, in a form of a representation. So the focus, yeah. The sad news is that um, uh, harm, what is it? Like a uh, loss of exactly. life, how, how much yeah. harm is that, right? And the sad well, answer is we have a dollar value for that. It's around $400,000 in the US. So there have been several instances where people actually explicitly signed like the, the compensation of 9-11, yeah. you know, some other places where the dollar values was, it was literally cashed out and it was calculated yeah. how much your, your worth, your life is worth. No, but I, that's clear. Okay, so, I, I, I think it's we, we important. We have a comment directly on, on, on that by, yeah. by one of our uh, uh, <laughs> the audience. Very interesting how human lives are counted in New Zealand. What is the opinion of the other panel members about this method? Maybe you can just um, say something about that, the rest of you. Well, I mean, social cost, the dollar value yeah. for social cost of, of every traffic accident. Yeah. I mean, there's but, a mathematical form behind it. So they just have some, probably some, some. Um, uh, fixed values for, okay, a death is worth this much and so forth. But if the thing is it exists at all, that they actually associate a social cost that is not just, uh, yeah, I'm, actually, I don't know how they calculate it, but the thing is it's in the database, it's building. I think there's, there's, it's very important to distinguish the representation of what you think is valuable and the discussion about how valuable you think it is. And these two things are usually not uh, distinguished. So first we have to understand what a good what actually do we want to discuss about value? First, we want to understand what actually we should ask about values. Uh, like so, to be alive. Huh? Yeah, life, I for like example. Okay. Alive. Yeah, I think so that, but that is in the definition that is in the mathematical definition of uh, physical mm -hmm. and mental harm. So this is, this is where we should first understand what is this good representation. AI cannot, AI cannot understand it. AI cannot understand ethics. So we as humans have to explain that to these to this AI systems in some kind of mathematical way. It will always be some kind of an approximation because it is never what we humans actually do. But we somehow have to do this in the best mathematical uh, uh, formulations and the best approximation of what we actually value. And then we can have a discussion about how valuable actually everybody thinks this is. But first we have to understand what actually we want to ask. There is another but question re related to that also. Is, the scary part is that, I mean, we can have all of these discussions and we can develop all these frameworks. But while we do that, Waymo is already driving around in Arizona and doing it. Yeah. That's the thing, like we're a bit late to the party. No, so I don't think so. Leon, maybe we can think think so. try okay. to 
we can try to answer some questions that, that we got on the way. Um, so okay, so right. there is also the question of cultural background uh, raised by Christian Wolf. So how do you think the cultural background should be taken into account for autonomous vehicles? Because I think that probably relates to, to what you've been saying. So for instance, in Germany, you know, like we have supposedly uh, a stronger popularity of deontological ethics. Um, I mean, you even have fundamental critics like Katrin Misselhorn in, in Stuttgart saying that we cannot have autonomous vehicles if they have to take you know, like ethical yeah. decisions because this is uh, restricted to the human domain. Like Great Britain or the US might tend more to utilitarian approach. Uh, so, so should different, and this is a question that's also raised to me, uh, if the car you know, like passes a border, um, would they have to apply a different ethical logic? I would be very interested in and also what the rest of the panel thinks about this. Hmm. Yeah, maybe I've, 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 we really thought about this. So I think I can give a, a very uh, specific answer to that. So again, we need to distinguish representation, which is, for example, utilitarianism, deontologic is representation. It's not so much about value, it's about representation of uh, what harm is. Um, and uh, the other thing is value. Uh, so, but for both, you could have cultural differences. For both, it, in principle, it could be possible that you say, indeed, <laughs> in this country, I drive along these uh, kind of uh, ideas. And you go to another country and, and, and the vehicle has this type of uh, 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 behavior according to this type of uh, uh, goal function that you put into this system. That is, in principle, possible. And it actually, it's also done in the laws because in the laws are different in different countries. So that is, in principle, possible. Yeah, it, it's, it's uh, possible. I can, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, okay. Uh, go ahead. Stop, go ahead. You, when you are done, I'll come in. Maybe just uh, one uh, one comment on that. It, certainly, it's it's possible to to change uh, ethics settings. I think there was even there was one author who had this as an as a thought experiment to have an ethics uh, button in your car, which you had <coughs> then switched to from one one ethics setting to another. Uh, but I mean. If, um, I think, uh, well, first of all, this question is very relevant in Europe, but not in many other regions actually of the world. Uh, it's it's interesting when, when when you think about it in in regions like like uh, let's say China or Japan, of course, but in Australia, New Zealand as well, you almost never cross a border or even never. <laughs> um, whereas in Europe, well, you, you have to compete with sheep and cows for yeah. priority on the road. But yeah, maybe they have different eth ethics settings. Yeah, their ethical understanding is a little bit limited. So yeah. yeah. And and okay and and so so yeah so within Europe I think we need to uh, we need to come to a joint understanding and uh, maybe it's 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 a kind of minimal consensus but uh, I, I think that that won't be possible uh, to to uh, to uh, have different uh, fundamental ideas here um, I, I think this is also what we witnessed now I, I remember being being part of discussions with ministries in in France for example in in 2017 already and and the regulation process on the European level which is underway but it, it takes a while so uh, um, I, I guess we will need to somehow come to a joint understanding and and what we did as I said in this ethics committee some years ago in Germany was, was also to to try to get past this this uh, deontological utilitarian uh, distinction and and find uh, something that is acceptable to both sides. Like, for example, uh, you, you should not um, you should not discriminate based on personal characteristics, um, and this is something I think which is which is acceptable to both sides. Okay, th th uh, thank you, Christoph. The issue about morality, the issue about ethics and uh, morality programming as it applies to autonomous vehicles and even feeding into developing a regulatory framework within which autonomous vehicles are accepted within a particular locality, brings in the whole idea of, uh, can we have a regulatory framework that is acceptable by all? That is a tough one because when you talk of ethics, when you talk of morality, as has already been discussed, what is considered to be right in one environment may not necessarily be accepted in another environment. And how do you incorporate all this into the programming as far as autonomous vehicles <laughs> are concerned? I mean, yeah. considering the whole issue of safety, you go yeah. to New Zealand uh, in optimization, we are putting a certain quantum on human life. 
Are yeah. we ready to accept that when it comes to an African and American or an Asian environment? The discussion looking at it must border on globally what is acceptable. If we are looking at autonomous vehicles, for instance, in the environment where some of us come from, we are currently not developing autonomous vehicles. These have to be developed in Europe, in America, in other places, and then brought into an environment. How do you take into consideration the environment within which these vehicles will be driven before even they are programmed and then shipped into those environments? I think that in this discussion and moving beyond this discussion, it is important that we look at what is ethically acceptable across board as far as autonomous vehicles are concerned. Yes, that, that, that's what I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah, I think there is another the scale, interesting the part of that. Sorry, if I can interject the scale part of that. Tesla approximately it was six months ago, they had another software update, which enabled a Tesla to understand what a road cone is. And that was six months ago. And how can you allow any car to be on the road without understanding what a road cone is? I mean, in Christchurch, we've got more road cones than traffic lights. Mm -hmm. And it is crazy. And that is, but the crazy, the, the, the scary part is they are already in the market. They're already doing it. You know, it's, it's really. Yes, and they, are in and they are in trouble too. And they will get in trouble because they cannot explain what the behavior when it goes wrong. And so, and it's also a very problematic in this sense, this approach is very problematic when you talk about responsibility. So yeah. all these issues and explainability. So all these issues they are having trouble with now. And it's already from our understanding quite clear that they cannot go beyond uh, further autonomy if there is not a real causal model in these type of systems that can reason about it. So it is the same actually, which is happening now in understanding images or understanding environments. It's the same thing. We need a hybrid system to really understand. Uh, and even then we claim that an AI system cannot understand ethics in the way humans can. So the only thing we can do still is try to approximate it in a causal model as best as possible. And we humans can even understand this causal model because we, we have to fabricate it ourselves. We cannot, <laughs> cannot, uh, cannot, can, AI cannot simply generate that itself. But see, but again, it's already happening. There are people yes. on yes. the road yes. in the US with a Tesla yeah. who put this yeah. weight on their steering wheel. Yes. And they just. That's this is exactly why we, this is exactly why we have to regulate this at lightning speed and understand how to regulate this because it's going wrong. <laughs> it is uh, not on the working. Other hand, I mean, the question about you know, internationalism. I mean, see, yes, there are lo small local differences, but there's also like the big lines. I think we can all agree on. We don't want to die. We don't want to crash. I mean, these things are pretty universal, and we can pretty easily kind of rule this out. Smaller but, things, smaller crashes, or certain but I'm, kind of I'm in a worldwide AI things. safety field, and there are Americans too, and they acknowledge exactly this what I'm saying here. So they know that we need a utility function for if you go further into this type of thing, you need this and you need the causal model to understand AI safety, also in the in mobility domain. This is simply quite clear. You cannot. But there's a certain limit to what you can do with uh, well, people. Well, not necessarily. So you can play it safe and you can just, the car could just say, whenever I encounter a situation that I cannot fully comprehend, I just stop, right? The problem is you wouldn't really get anywhere very fast. No, right? because it doesn't and, understand what it doesn't understand. So <laughs> in okay, order to, okay. to, to know that you do not know, you need to know something. This is the problem. So they are well, not what they are not what we call technically self-aware. So they do not really understand at all what they are doing. So that was the Uber crash essentially, right? Yeah. I mean, so there, there's also this importance in system engineering and AI system engineering that systems become technically what we call technically self-aware that they can do self-assessment and self-management, and they can also only do that with causal models, not with deep learning. I think we have some more questions from the floor, of Matthias. Right. Yeah, I mean, one of the questions I think has partly been answered because there is a um, the question on regulation, uh, which I think is also an interesting one. So based on the discussion, splitting the safety level for social general benefit, reduce global casualties versus private user benefit. Uh, the question here is to which extent do you think regulation should take 
uh, control on this prior prioritization. And I think the, 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 the example that's often used is also that, you know, like an argument that Thomas Schelling had made that behind the veil of ignorance, we would all vote for utilitarian setting. But then, of course, you know, like being the car owner, we do have different priorities. So this could be seen, I think, Christoph, uh, as, a, as kind of a prisoner's dilemma. And so would we need regulation to overcome this sort of problem? I think that's what the question refers to. I mean, Again, I want, want to stress maybe, but this is really important. So and I think it also is in line with what Christoph uh, says. So we uh, have been used to be forced to think in terms of consequentialist utilitarianism, deontological ethics. It, the, what we find is all these representations are way too simple. So we need to think about better representations. So if we if we ask all the already the question we're already in the wrong setting because this is not really <laughs> this is not really a discussion again you should really have the discussion about what is actually a good discussion about see, the scary part is yeah. autonomous vehicles are so seductively great the benefit they bring is so huge that people already today even without any of that working people risk their lives doing it because it is so tempting, it is so beneficial. And again, oh, people I, will I, probably yeah. just accept the risk that my car makes mistakes and it, yes. and there will be a certain I, failure I, rate and there will be a certain amount yeah. of deaths and people will probably tolerate it. And it's even possible that people will accept a higher, let's say casualty rate than currently with human drivers just for the convenience. It's, it's, I, that I, can I, think that, I think that is true, but still we need to do that in the best possible way. So I'm very positive actually about- uh, Okay, but then we how, go to do kind of like the best possible versus way, one solution that's just good enough, you know? And again, right now- Well, why, why not try the best possible way? <laughs> why not try the best possible way? Yeah, there is a well, completely- yeah, no, I completely the, agree. It's definitely something desirable, but the point is because the benefit is so large, people yeah. will compromise and they say okay. like even if the car is not perfect i will still do it because it is so great because i can read and i can play my videos and i can watch tiktok because that's more important to me than being safe yes uh, true but i from my perspective always will try to make it better so uh yeah. Better Leon, first off, I, I think that since since time is running out, I mean, there is one topic that I would really love to tackle before we, before we are running out of time, because we haven't talked, I think, about hybrid uh, traffic. And I think it was, uh, I read a paper, paper from you, uh, the two Christophs uh, uh, recently, in which you uh, like basically are writing about uh, the problem, you know, like that on American roads, you know, maybe like 55 miles per hour, which may be the speed rule, but humans, you know, may, may just go on average uh, with, 50, uh, with 70 miles per hour. And if you, if you assume that you know, like you have uh, hybrid traffic, you know, people, the people of the manually driven cars will just engage, you know, like in very dangerous uh, maneuvers while the cars the, the, the autonomous drivers uh, will stick to the rules. So, and this, of course, I think raises a very interesting question that maybe we can like tackle in the remaining minutes. Should we have uh, um, human traffic in like in this transition phase? Uh, should we have human traffic and automated traffic, fully automated traffic, on separate lanes? Do do we have to to keep like both kinds of traffic separate to 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 avoid these sorts of problems? Or what's your take on that? I would say, I mean, for the general setting of traffic, this is not possible. It's it's unrealistic to have that. In in some settings, yes, uh, when you have what, what we are currently doing, for example, these automatic sh shuttles, uh, this is something we, we can see. But even there, the idea is to have them interact actually with other traffic. So so I would say this is this has been tried for some time, but I, I don't think this will work on, on a larger scale. Um, actually, this this question that you raised was uh, Christopher was the, um, brought up by our co-author Alan Alan Wagner, uh, who said that in, in in Pennsylvania the people don't drive fifty five miles per hour, but but seventy on average. Um, and um, I mean, this is this is something that we have to reckon with. Um, it, I would say, it's it's not even uh, not not only there is the question, but but in in Germany in particular, of course, with, when it comes to the autobahn traffic. 
uh, we have a problem. I talk to uh, people. Uh, if you have to reckon with with uh, speed, uh, yeah, uh, of, of more than two hundred uh, kilometers per hour, th that creates additional difficulties for for the cars. Um, so this is something. I, I'm I'm not saying what's the consequences of that, uh, and and uh, but but it's, it's something that we we have to take into account. And and for for the programming of assistance, it makes a difference if you have to only consider one hundred thirty. Uh, uh, or let's say a bit more, but but not with 200. Uh, well, that's, that's already like the interesting aspect. So I lived for many years in Eindhoven in Netherlands, just, you know, across the border. And whenever, you know, I drove from Germany to Netherlands and across the border and suddenly there was like 120 speed limit and everything just becomes so much more relaxed, you know, and you can just, you don't have to look always in the back mirror with something coming from the back. It just makes total sense. And again, it comes back to, the convenience of driving fast, you know, being more valuable than safety. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's to some degree crazy. And indeed, I think to some degree this will solve itself in the same way, you know, we used to, when I was driving a car, we all, everybody was driving stick, you know, that's going away, everybody's driving automatic. And the same thing will happen with autonomous vehicles as well. It will just slip in because if it is convenient and if it is uh, adds a benefit, um, it will be, a couple of years, uh, but I think assuming that the um, performance of autonomous vehicles is reasonably good, um, it will push away all manual driving. Uh, if, I, if I can come in here, the, 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 there is also the issue of autonomous vehicles are not uh, independent of their environment. You are driving the autonomous vehicles within an environment where there are other manual drivers. and how they behave and what they do on the road is something that you cannot easily predict. And so even though you find the use of autonomous vehicles convenient and the drift will be towards that, it is important that one appreciates that it is within a certain environment, it is within a certain context. And to the extent that society has not given 100% approval of it, getting it out of the way and getting a hundred percent approval for autonomous vehicles is going to be difficult. My yes, I, I, mean, I used to drive, yes. I mean, I used to visit Egypt uh, quite often and um, traffic lights are at best a suggestion over there. And, <laughs> and <laughs> so autonomous vehicles that obey traffic lights would stand no chance driving there. They would never get anywhere because they just can't. Yeah. No, because I think this is very important. This is a fundamental limit. So at, at type one AI, so the AI systems, current AI systems will never be able to predict as well as humans what other behavior of other humans will be or interpret the situation in this complex environments, including humans, uh, will be able to understand the situation as good as humans can. So this is a fundamental limit of the current AI. Uh, so this, this actually are, I think, the two fundamental limits. The one is that they cannot really, <laughs> and so they can also not really understand human, human ethics. So mm -hmm. these are the, the limitations we have to live with. But still within those limitations, I think a lot of is possible. Yeah. Uh, how is that, that limit fundamental? Because uh, AI, is uh, okay. This is, we we come too deep into our, but we we saw a fundamental difference between human uh, what humans do and what current AI is possible of. And basically, it comes boils down to that uh, current AI is not able to consciously construct new knowledge. No, so, but to, to predict to predict uh, movement of of others, that's quite possible. Yeah, but a human. Yeah, of course, you can have a model of that. Of course. But you can never understand as good as an other human what in a particular situation a human would do, because therefore you need to have this human understanding of what human actually is. So maybe but, let me raise. Me. But even humans learn that by observation from others, right? Maybe. Yes, but they have a they they have a type two brain, so they they understand and mm -hmm. and they are conscious. And an AI again, is not that. Exactly. Yeah, but animals can also do Before that. Before we, I mean, what's, what's I think we, 
I think we have to come to an end, and I would like to, 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 to have you take like on a, on a very last question, because it sounds like such a simple question, uh, which is by Klaus Wagner, and he's, he was the first one to raise the question, so I really want, want that one to be answered. Safe distance, why not apply the rule of thumb you learn when you get training for a driver's license nowadays? The rule is half the value indicated by the speedometer in kilometers per hour, and this value in meters taken as safe distance. So why is it so complicated? That's uh, that's known as time to contact, yes. In uh, in, in movement, yes. Yeah, well, I, it's it's very simple. It, it is you you can do in, in AI. You can do a calculation. You can say you can take all the models of the of the vehicle into account, and then you can t uh, calculate the probability that there will be a collision and so on. And then you can also say, oh, okay, but how many people are in this in this vehicle and so on. So you can in AI. This is the, this is actually the problem. What <laughs> is the solution? But also the problem of AI that AI can actually reason about all those things. So then the question, of course, comes. Yeah, but if a human also does that, but it is fake. And if you go to a judge, then it makes up the story. But in an AI system, you have to really implement an algorithm. So therefore, you need to know it. Okay. I but it comes back to the overall question is, um, and I agree that I have come to some concerns about what AI can in principle do or not do. Um, but there's also the, 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 the fact that approximating it, getting it 95% working, will probably be sufficient for most people to buy a car that has an autopilot. Okay, gentlemen, I'm afraid time's up. So I have to thank you for this extremely lively discussion, I believe. <laughs> uh, also, thank you to the audience for the questions. And yeah, um, thanks so much. Uh, hope to see you soon. <laughs>